Hey everybody, how you doing? Aaron back with you. It's been a couple of weeks since we've actually had a podcast out. Um, we've had a lot of really great things happening at the center, and I had to kind of focus on those before I really got back into releasing some podcasts. So I apologize. I know you guys look for the content and you look for new things, and and I want to provide that to you. So first and foremost, I'm very, very sorry that I haven't gotten that to you each and every week. Like I said, I would. So like I said, I, I think it's going to be one of those things where I can get you continued content. I'm never going to just not stop the podcast. So don't ever worry about that. We're always here. We're always going to keep pushing new stuff out to you. So don't worry. Um, so today in the podcast, I have with me Amber. Uh, I am not releasing her last name due to her wishes because um, of the situation that she was in. Uh, it was a very serious situation and I want to respect her privacy on that because it's something that, you know, maybe, maybe she's not necessarily okay with sharing everything about her life, but she's willing to share something that's so personal and so horrible that's happened in her life. And I want to make sure that I'm able to respect her wishes on that. So Amber is a domestic abuse survivor who wants to raise the awareness of trauma and the lasting effects related to the covert abuse that she has had. And it's a very, very powerful story because if you're not in a situation like this, sometimes you can't even fathom what somebody is going through. Giving a story like this, giving a powerful insight to what it really can be about is so informative and we need to understand that and we need to encourage and promote the fact that it's okay to talk about a situation you're in. So that's why I want Amber on the podcast. So if you guys have any questions at all, please reach out. And first and foremost, I will tell you this with 100% confidence. If there is a situation that you are in that is a domestic abuse situation or, or anything that you think is not right, please reach out. There are so many resources for you. You need to understand that, look, if you feel like something's not right, it probably isn't. So please make sure you take this to heart and make sure that you are there and present for the people in your life because you deserve a quality life. And I want to make sure that there is every opportunity for you, even if you feel like there's not. So please, please listen to the podcast. If you have questions, concerns, please, at the end of the podcast, I will give you my information. Please reach out. As always, I really, really hope you enjoy this podcast. Again, this is with Amber. Let's roll. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Tonight, I have with me Amber. She is a domestic abuse survivor who wants to raise the awareness of trauma and the lasting effects of and related to covert abuse in relationships. So, Amber, thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure. So, and when we were talking before the podcast started, you were talking about covert abuse. And I, you know, I was a police officer prior to this, but I've never heard that term before. So what exactly is covert abuse? So I think when people think of abuse, they imagine like physical, which is more like overt and like the put downs and maybe even emotional abuse. But what I really want to bring awareness to is the like psychological, the manipulating. When I left, which was almost two years ago, actually the domestic violence piece of it, which came eight years into the relationship, was the best thing that happened to me. Um, yeah. Getting physically assaulted because it 
woke me up to the fact that this might be abuse. And then to the domestic violence, my advocate who brought some insight and um, yeah. Well, you said this, this kind of occurred like eight years into your relationship? Yes. Did, did you ever see anything prior to that? Like, like, obviously in the beginning in relationships, everything seems to be so great and so perfect. But when, like, looking back, did you see any signs of any sort of abuse prior to that, Mark? No, because I think that's part of the whole, what sucks you in is like kind of what they, the mask and kind of what they portray themselves as. And then, yeah, once, I don't know, I mean, on on our honeymoon, that's when I, I could see the signs right away. But at that point, it was like, we're married. And Mm -hmm. I did try to reach out like two years into the relationship. um, When I started to see signs of the abuse more and more but at that point nobody believed me and I think I went from I just started to like check out zone out yeah kind of probably two years into it three years into it and then I'd say like for a good three-year period I was just in a like zombie like state like yeah. real yeah. checked out um before all this I was a full-time student. Um, I had a full-time job. Um, a lot of friends three years into the relationship, maybe even a year into the relationship, I started to become like a prisoner to my home and eventually my room. Um, and then something in me, I think after Um, my second son was born and was diagnosed with autism, something in me like started to wake up. Mm -hmm. I'm still like processing all this and trying to figure out like what exactly happened. But I think that's part of, I don't know, like survive, some survival instinct, like started to kick in, like, you need to get your kids out of here. But sure. my brain was like, that's when um, the like manipulation started, like got even worse. But something like in me knew that I had to leave. Yeah. Um, but when I left at that point, I had been diagnosed with bipolar and agoraphobia, mm-hmm. which is the fear of leaving your home. Sure. And um, had papers written up that I would never be able to work again. Um, my now ex-husband, um, I I had believed that I was mentally and physically incapable of, of anything. Mm -hmm. So when I left, I was so brainwashed that, um, I don't know, something, I, Something in me got me out of there. Sure. And and I'm sure with you raising kids, that probably did spark something to say like, hey, I need to do what's best for them. And then all of a sudden, it seems like you could almost recognize maybe those little things that you didn't see prior to that. And I can only imagine how that feeling of being trapped in something can be so just so frustrating and so just hopelessness is the best way I could feel like that. When, like when you started to kind of something woke up in you, you said, what was like the first step? Like, how did you feel that second that you said, all right, something woke up in me. So how, what was the steps that you took? So like now looking back, I can see that something woke up in me, but I think the, so I don't know, I lived in like fight or flight for so long that like my, I started to see physical symptoms, like my hair was falling out. Um, I had like so many diagnoses at that time. Like I was on like 10 different medications. My heart rate was, 
I didn't sleep for like a year or two because I couldn't get my heart rate down. Yeah. Um, I started like fantasizing about like like hurting myself, dying. Yeah. And I was like, my kids need me. Um, but what really sparked me to leave was my autistic son. He would take my son for hours at a time and I didn't know where he was and it ended up that he was using him to shoplift. <laughs> so that really like, Oh my God. That. And then the domestic violence incident is what really like when I found that out, I left the next day. So sometimes I think it's like those like big things that I needed to it, some validation, I guess. Sure. Um, well, yeah. it sounded like there was so much compounding things that like basically were showing you, Yes, this is wrong. This is not healthy. This isn't good. But I, I, I'm honestly shocked to hear that somebody would use an, your autistic son to shoplift. I mean, like that to me, that's that's so immoral. I can't even imagine somebody doing that. Well, you don't like, and that's the like craziest thing because until um, actually my advocate like told me that it was on that she could see that he had gotten a citation or whatever. Yeah. But you're just, you just are so used to like doubting yourself and not trusting your instincts at all that even though I saw like signs around the house, like we had more, like started accumulating like more and more things from like stores, boxes of like movies or whatever. Like you just are terrified to like, when I did confront him about it, it's like, you have so much, you like, your brain is so traumatized. Like I was, I don't know, like people don't understand that. Like, why don't, why didn't you just like, I wasn't allowed to look at the bank accounts and um, things like that. Like, why didn't you just, it's like, no, over eight years of that, you get so grinded down, so, so worn down and you don't trust, like you start to question your sanity. Like, like, mm-hmm. oh, maybe. Ha- have you ever heard of what Stockholm Syndrome is? Yes. Is yes. that what it's kind of similar to? Yes. Yeah, so actually, I've seen a counselor and she said she um, thinks that I had Stockholm Syndrome or definitely a trauma bond. So that's another huge piece of it is that person that's causing you like so much distress is the one that you go to for comfort. So. Yeah, you get addicted yeah. um, to them. Exactly. Wow. I, you know, it, it's amazing to to hear all this, and it's just it's so humbling at the sense of like you know you think everybody always has this perfect marriage, everything's good because you don't hear about stories like this. You don't hear about people being manipulated and not saying anything because of the fear of maybe saying something or even the fear of just you're that quote unquote brainwashed. I, I can only imagine how much of a toll that probably had to take on you to, to say, yes, this is not right. I need to move on. And I think we were talking before the podcast, you were talking about an incident that really kind of not necessarily like enlightened you or opened your eyes, but you said that was like the the one incident that did it. Well, that like got the ball rolling because I think what had happened is like, I got pushed too far at that point. And I think that's what a lot of times happens um, to get women to leave. Like it really has to be their decision. And when they're ready, like when, I mean, I think the statistic is women go back like seven times. Um, mm-hmm. But I like really had to like be pushed to get to leave, to make me leave that home. But then after that, that's like just the beginning because then like I didn't even recognize my own voice for like a year after I left. Like his voice is what I heard in my head only. Like my voice was so buried that I was just kind of going through the motions. I didn't have my brain back until recently. Like people don't get that either. Like my brain was so taken over after I'm sure after years of, of psychological and emotional abuse that 
Yeah, I at least I can see it from I can see it from a law enforcement side because that's I, I did see those situations. But for the people that maybe haven't seen it, it's probably hard to understand unless you're in it. But I can only imagine that every move you make was always determined by th- this man or things that you wanted to even do were always determined by him. And when you're in it, like you don't see it. I didn't see it that way. Like he yeah. was my savior. Like he was my, I believed I couldn't take care of my kids. I believed that I could never work again. I believed I had been actually, there was so much stress in the home, but I didn't realize until a year or two after I left, like it was all the phys, all my physical diagnosis. Like I was on like painkillers and anxiety medications. And I thought I was just this wreck. Like I couldn't do it without him. I mean, after I left, I would have like literal panic attacks over putting gas in my car, like, um, taking my son to the doctor. I was, I mean, that would give me like a whole day of panic attacks because I had this person that did everything for me. I was just, did not think I was capable. So there's been a lot of like huge victories. Um, like I recently got a job and got my own place, but like no one helped me with that. I had to do that. So tell me, tell me about that process. Tell me about when you said, I'm, I'm done. I don't need this anymore. How, like, obviously it was difficult. I mean, you said you did it on your own. Uh, Tell me about that process. Even like when I had left, I, I don't know. I felt kind of done, but also at the same time, I, it was like a survival thing to take my kids out of the home. I didn't, I didn't know if I'd go back. Um, Some like will and me is the only thing that kept me from going back, like refusing to be that doormat anymore. So when I had first left like that, that was hard. But then what had followed was he filed for separation because I left trying to get me like back or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of like abuse in the court, um, like using that, I guess, to like further cause me distress. So there was like, I mean, court alone was like 15 months of just so much stress. Um, And I'm sure using, using that as leverage in your relationships to still try to maintain that manipulation. Yep. And then, I mean, like at every exchange for my son, I had so much fear. I mean, I would shake the whole way there. I guess the only, so getting from like point A to point B of like that strength that you have to have, I had to like continually like step into my fears and it felt like climbing this mountain of, it's so hard to explain. It's like climbing out of this really, really dark pit. I was so hopeless and had so much, I don't know, you're so drained from all the abuse. And then you have now like all these responsibilities and losses. I mean, I lost like everything. Yeah. Everything familiar to me. I I got like two pieces of furniture from the divorce. My dog was like, I mean, something like that. He let me see my dog for like eight months. I mean, you're just really tortured. So. Wow. No, I, uh, that I, I, again, I can, I can't empathize with you on that because that's not something I've ever been in, but you explain it so well that I can sympathize so much with you because I I do understand how relationships can really change perspectives. They can change thoughts, but to hear that, you know, there was manipulation beyond the, the actual you know, relationship, it was in court, it's at custody exchanges, it's at, you know, even just having like your dog, that that is so hard to fathom that. And for people that have never been in your situation, to hear that, and to hear that you are here, you're still 
doing that and now saying, I need to advocate for the people that can't do that right now. I need mm-hmm. to be there for them. I think that that's, that's a, that's a gift that not a lot of people have. Yeah. There was some, there's, I mean, from this experience, I really want to like help bring awareness to not only how, like how psychological, emotional, that piece of it in in relationships and then like the trauma bond involved. And I think a lot of times, even I, before all this could be like, how do women stay? How, why do they go back? It's because of it's relentless and you, you have no trust in yourself. You have no, you've been like, you're don't have any empowerment. So you think like you need that person so much. Like, I mean, getting divorced alone is hard. Right. Having, I mean, for me personally, having a child with a disability is hard being isolated. I mean, I had no relationships really with any family or friends at that point. Um, And then any, like any type of support I had was like turned against me because he was so good at manipulating. Um, I was seen as crazy, even by people who knew about the domestic violence incident. I mean, you don't get, I don't know. He was involved in our church and I had to leave that too. Like, you don't get a divorce in yeah. certain people's eyes and yeah. And that's got to be so difficult to navigate through. Honestly, I hear hearing that has to, it's got to spark something in anybody to hear that your entire life has been uprooted on a basis of lies on a basis of manipulation. And that to me, that's something that I think people need to understand that you know, you you could say, why didn't that person leave? It's it's happening. We can see it. Even the people on the outside could see it. But at the same time, you're not in it. You don't see it. You probably can't fathom really going through it. Well, I think actually, like when they're when it's physical, people can see it. But sure, yeah, absolutely. People yeah. didn't. People didn't see. I mean they thought like, oh, she's mentally ill or whatever. Yeah. Um, And people, I think that's why the domestic violence incident was the best thing that's happened to me because everyone, like myself and everyone around me thought that I was incapable of anything. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. I I just had to literally go with some, some very buried intuition I had that got me I don't know but but you know what sometimes you can't describe what it is that drives you to do what you do I mean you You can't can't. you can try to explain it to anybody but no matter what that's the feeling that you had inside that that drove you to say this is not right this is it I'm out I'm done and to do it in such a I would say very difficult fashion with a divorce, with, with custody, with things like that, that shows resilience. It shows that there is something in you that you probably didn't see initially, but it's there. And that's, what's Mm -hmm. super important. And and I, I can only imagine that if somebody was in that relationship and heard what you were talking about and heard, you said, you know, my name's Amber. I went through this situation that was so detrimental to me and I got out of it how important that is for you to share, how important that is for people to hear. At the same time, though, it's like you get out of it, but it's an extremely, like, lonely and confusing, like, even two years later, everyday struggle and battle to challenge, like, what ha- what you've been told for so long, like, even before I did this podcast today, I am, I mean, I believe it's my fault every day still. I don't know. It's just a very like lonely journey at the sure. same time. So what, what coping mechanisms do you use to kind of combat that? Like, cause you know that it wasn't entirely your fault. Like, you know that, but what do you do to help you kind of reinforce that thought? 
Um, I mean, some days are better than others. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as time goes on, it gets easier to challenge those things. My, I mean, journaling has helped. Um, mm. Trying to like find joy in like the little things. Yeah. I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's always an on the spot question. Like it, it's, yeah. it's hard because yeah, sometimes you just can't describe it. I'm sure like, so I deal with anxiety and depression and I have a marriage that is very much affected by that. Like my, my wife and I argue quite a bit about those things. The thing is sometimes I can't describe, I can't understand why things the way they are, but it's hard to sometimes really grasp what you're thinking or how you're able to cope with it. Sometimes it's just laying in bed and, you know, just yeah, doing that. I mean, I've like written a lot of this down because when you're like in the midst of it, I think like when women typically go back is probably like six months ago or a year ago from where I'm at, like that place in between like getting from when you leave and then to where I am now where I can like hear my inner voice and like do some of that healing work but like when you are trying to like get through like divorce hearings and kind of that adjustment transition phase and the PTSD symptoms and I mean I was like totally helpless from the relationship so just like rewriting all that stuff in my brain and pushing myself and all the losses a situ- like associated with it. And, oh, it's like <laughs> a year ago or something, you would just feel this like pain in your brain and your body. Now I'm kind of like past that point. Um, it's hard to explain though. I mean, that's why I've written a lot of it down, but yeah. But that's that's valuable, and it's it's okay to feel that way. I don't think it's ever like me to say, "No, you shouldn't feel that way. You're out of it." No, of course you you could feel that way. That's that's years and years of going through something that you're so accustomed to, and it's hard to break. It's almost like an addiction. I, I could almost it, say, well, I, yes, it is. I mean. I did have to, they explain it like narcissistic abuse. Breaking that is similar to breaking a heroin addiction. And I can relate to that. When I was forcing myself to have very minimal contact, I mean, I used to like, I mean, it's hard to like believe, but I used to like thrash around in my bed, like so, like so addicted to this person. Yeah. So addicted to the cycle of abuse of that, like, like, yeah, it felt like a drug had been ripped for me. Um, the fear that like kept me in my room that long, like it was a very, it's very like hard to explain. But I don't, I don't think anybody would ever judge you for that because again if if anybody's ever been addicted to something they also know how hard it is to break that i but yeah i i can completely see that and i see how you talk about thrashing in your bed i get that i do because yeah sometimes the only way to just express yourself is by you know just acting out or whatever but to to get to your point like that was probably one of the hardest things for that you've ever had to do. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, and that was one of the, what you're, I mean, I don't know. I'm interested in like learning more of the technical, <laughs> whatever behind it. Cause it's like fascinating to me that your brain can be changed that much from abuse. Like people think like, it's just, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm dealing with a lot of the emotional stuff afterward, but the chemicals that are like released in your brain that like that up and down, like the stress. And then Mm -hmm. I think it's like dopamine and oxy something. Yeah. Um, That's like literally like pulsing through your body. So when that was like taken from me, all of a sudden, like when you're used to that, like cycle and the, your body being pumped full yep. of those chemicals, like I really did go through a lot of withdrawal symptoms. Y- you were detoxing. Exactly. And 
at that point had no, I was so, ugh, it was very hard. <laughs> and I can only imagine that you're still probably going through that detoxing. Yes. But luckily now I have worked on rebuilding my life, which also has been a lot of work where, I mean, tomorrow I get to go to work. Um, yeah. But when you're in it, you have nothing to look forward to. You have no outlets. It just feels very hopeless and like yeah. you're at the bottom of a pit. So, And to, to, to hear that, to hear that you still can keep fighting, you can keep moving forward is very empowering, I think, to mm -hmm. a lot of people. And, I mean, your story, I'm sure, is very unique in the sense of you have an autistic son. You have, you said you have two sons? Yes. Having, I have a, sorry, yeah. go ahead. I have a um, 13 year old who I think that was part of why I left too. I started to see him like withdrawal and I was scared that eventually next, like he started to rub like stand up and I thought he, you know, there might be a domestic incident with him, but then I, yes, then I had my, three um he's four now but when i left he wasn't even a he wasn't even verbal um yeah. he was diagnosed with severe autism now he is talking and um but yeah that was a huge reason also why i stayed just all the fear associated like how can i i can't take my autistic son from, I mean, they really need like routine and yeah. consistency. And I was like, I can't take him from his home. And this right. is where he gets day to day therapy. Like I had, you know, work to set up. That was like the one thing that I think also got me out was the passion I had to see my son, like, I don't know, getting involved in his therapy and things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had set it up where it was in our home and I was like, I can't just take him from that. And I had all his toys like perfectly, you know, set up or whatever. And right. I remember looking at it one day and crying and knew knowing I had to leave it all behind. I, yeah. And then helping him adjust. Like once we left, I mean, we lived with my parents for like a year and a half. And I mean, it, we were living at that when we left, it was like a pretty much empty house because they were in the process of like about to sell it. And we didn't, I mean, we slept on like mattresses and yeah. it was horrible to, I mean, I think that'd be hard for any two, three year old to adjust to, but when they have autism and yeah, it was that, extremely difficult. That's a whole nother area yeah. that not many people experience. And to, I mean, to, for you to share that, I'm sure it has to be extremely difficult, but I think it's so valuable that people understand that. Yeah. And, and I mean, that alone, like I feel is very isolating when you have like a special needs child. Cause I mean, he's got, he's had enough therapy now where like we can, I can take him to the park or things like mm -hmm. that, but people don't understand, you know, that piece of it too like when he was two or three years old he wouldn't play at a park he'd like run off into the street like they don't yeah. understand some of those social um yeah so that was a whole nother piece to it too to to hear everything that you've gone through to hear everything that i mean honestly i i have to completely tell you that i think it's so valuable to, for people to hear what you're saying because you have gone through hell and back and you're still resilient and you're still saying i want people to hear this i want people to know that it's okay and you can still get out i i, I give you so much credit to be able to do what you do day in and day out so i, I mean, seriously that is got to be something that's so hard to do i have two kids two small kids one two and a half and a nine month old, they drive me crazy just because they're two and a half <laughs> and, you know, nine months old. I cannot even imagine the, the struggles and the, the, the hardships that you went through. And I cannot thank you enough for, for sharing that. And 
I, I wow. I, I honestly, th- like this has left me very speechless because I don't, I don't know how you could have gone through something like that. I don't know how anybody can really have that courage and have the charisma to go and leave a situation like that. It's, I mean, I really want people to know that it's possible. And there were so many days that I just told myself, like, I can't like, yeah, I can't like, but then you pick, you have to pick yourself up back up and it's okay to feel like you can't and have many, many days where you question if you can pick yourself up, but it's about actually doing it. And that's such a good point to kind of go into to the ending here. So I ask a question to every guest I have on the podcast and you can interpret this however you want, because I feel like this is very valuable for people to say what they feel from the inside, from the experience that you've gone through. So the question is, what's your advice for anybody that's ever been in your situation or has resonated with something that you've said to me? That you, you can do it. Like, like the human, like spirit or will, even when you like have nothing and you have all the obstacles in the world ahead of you, trauma and despair and losses, you can overcome that. And, and I think you're a very living, breathing example of that. Who, who's gone through something that's terrible and horrible, and yet you still see a light at the end of the tunnel. You've always seen the light. It's just sometimes was shrouded. No, actually, like, there's this, one of my favorite pictures is somebody crunched up kind of in this, like, dark position. They're, like, walking toward the light, and they, as they walk, it gets, like, lighter and lighter until they're, like, standing. And I feel like I'm there now, but when you're in that darkness, you, like, I did not see the light. I, it was so hopeless and so, I had so much despair, but just, I guess I asked myself, like, what's my choice? Like, I ha I don't know. You just right. fight. So I think, I think that you're doing very great work with, with your advocacy to help people in this situation. And I'm glad that you decided to share your story with us and share how you are doing because people need to hear that. And people need to understand that this world doesn't have to be about bad things. It doesn't have to be despair. It doesn't have to be hatred. That there is a way to get out of a negative situation. And it's not easy, but at least you can do it. And you're a living prime example of that. I guess like one of the things that did help me through it too, that I want people to know is from this experience, like I almost see it now as it was like a catalyst for like huge personal growth. And I am so much stronger. Like I grieve that like person that now almost 10 years ago had to go through all that. But at the same time, I'm so much stronger. So you not only can get through it, but you can come out stronger and then right. help others. And that is exactly what you're doing. I mean, mm-hmm. plain and simple, that is. And so before we kind of wrap this up, is there anything that you would like to tell the audience? Anything you want to promote? Anything that you feel is very valuable to you or anything that you want to talk about before we kind of end this? One thing that I did want to talk about is like that I think there needs to be a lot more education about this. I mean, I was like reaching up, you know, for like a lifeline and tried to get reaching for help in the ways that I could like going to like mental, like mental health professionals and in my church and telling them things. And like, no one believed me. Like they just kept prescribing me more medications and Mm -hmm. things like that. And I think being able to have like more resources, more education, more support so that 
Having um, my advocate at the domestic violence shelter, I was led to like continue to like believe in me. Like she was probably the only person that believed in me for a long time when I didn't even believe in myself. And I'm still working on that. Um, Having more people like be an encouragement and in those like weak, I guess more like people that can empower those who are like suffering through something like this and give them hope is and I think, like huge. And I, and I think there's plenty of centers in areas that, you know, you could always just Google, but I think that's a very valuable thing to check into if you're in a situation like that. I think it's one of those things that we need to bring more awareness to because people are, are suffering. People are suffering in silence and there's not a voice for that. So if you can find a way to do that, that's very, very valuable and find an, a, a center that can maybe advocate for you, you know, for the people that maybe aren't able to talk, you know. Or even like some, you know, maybe people being um, more aware of like, I mean, I've had like my hairdresser who said to me like, yeah, I, I was, I thought it was really weird how like, your hair like was really falling out and how like you couldn't even make the appointments. Um, Just like with like sexual abuse, how they, you know, have trained like doctors to kind of look for some of those signs Mm -hmm. and things like that. Just, I don't know, having some awareness for some of those, like, I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to say. No, I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, uh, unbelievable. I I, I do. I I think early like warning signs yeah like somebody like isolating that like staying in their house like why didn't anybody I don't know if I'm in like a zombie like state and I used to be a full-time student who was active and outgoing why did it have outgoing and had a lot going for me and I I do now and I see that but like why did I don't know what, how, why did it have to get to like eight years of that? Like, and that's I where I think, I you're, and that's where I think you're right with the awareness and, and people being more educated to the signs yeah. and symptoms of domestic abuse, but not necessarily domestic physical abuse, but like you said in the beginning, covert abuse. Yeah. And like I, and very I, psych a lot, like to the point where you just really gaslighting is, was a huge part of it. Right. Like, you just doubt like everything and then you learn to not trust yourself. And I think, and I think that that's something that with continued advocacy of what you're doing and continued work for people to realize that that's only going to make it better. And I, and I, like I said, I truly am just humbled to the core about hearing your story and hearing about what you've gone through because that takes a lot out of a person, I can imagine. I honestly cannot thank you enough, Amber, for coming on and, and sharing your story. And as always, like I said, it, it, I, I am so happy to hear that you're not in a situation that's causing you that much pain anymore. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much, Amber, for coming on the podcast because it's not easy to share a story like that. It's not easy to open yourself up to be vulnerable in that sense. So from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you sharing that and giving us all an insight to what somebody in that situation can, can feel and understand. Like I said, from the beginning, if there is any situation that you are in and you feel like you are struggling or you feel like there is a problem, please reach out. Google those domestic resources in your area, because if there is a problem, you need help and you need to be okay. Nobody deserves to be treated in a horrible manner. I mean that. And you need to understand it, that you don't deserve anything but the best quality of life that you can have. So again, thank you so much, Anver. And if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out. I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. 
If you did, please like, share, subscribe, follow, whatever platform you're on. It's so important at this point to spread the message, to spread the awareness that we're trying to promote day in and day out. This is not easy anymore. Life has become so much more challenging, and we need to make sure that we can continue to keep spreading positivity and to make sure that we can keep encouraging others to be the best part of themselves. So please like, share, subscribe. We're part of a really awesome organization called the Mental Health News Radio Network. We have a partnership with them where it is so many podcasts that encourage talking about mental health, encourage talking about so many situations that people f- encounter every day, but maybe aren't so apt to talk about them. And we're just one of so many different great podcasts. So please check them out. Mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com. Check them out. They're so great and they're so amazing to have so many different kinds of podcasts that maybe can speak to you if anybody else can't. So with that, visit us on our social pages. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, Discord, everything. I mean, you name it, we're on it. It's insane. I LinkedIn. I mean, we just got ourselves finally okay with that, which again was my fault, but we're on that. We're on all of them. Please check them out. That's a lot of where we can get the most current up-to-date information out to you. We want your support. We want you to understand that we're doing things that are so valuable to the community, but also valuable to every single community that you are in. So please check us out on all the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, Discord. If you have questions, comments, concerns, anything for me that we've had on the podcast, please email me, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at centerforsuicideawareness.org. I want to, one, hear your feedback. Two, if you have questions, I can direct you to the resources that you need. I want you to understand that even though I may have never talked to you before. I want you to understand that I am still there for you. And if you have a question or you have a concern, that is valid. And I need to make sure that I do my due diligence to make sure that you are okay. So please reach out if you have questions, comments, or concerns. The Center for Suicide Awareness has an emotional support service that is called the Hope Line. All you would have to do is text HOPELINE to 741-741, and you'll be connected to a trained specialist free of charge to talk about any issue that you are facing. It does not have to be suicide. It does not have to be anything that you think it would be about. It is for anything and everything. It can be financial, relationships, advice, information, whatever you want. We are here for you. We have so many people available to talk to you. You are never, ever, ever alone. And you need to understand that because no matter what you are going through, there are so many people that can understand and that can feel exactly what you are going through. So please do not ever feel that it is weak to speak about what you are going through. I have done it so many times personally. So please understand that. Again, you can text HOPELINE to 741-741 for that immediate emotional support. I can't express to you enough how sometimes things are so hard. Sometimes you can't just express it. You can't. But I'm telling you, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. And I can tell you that from personal experience. Do not ever give up. Do not ever think that you are alone because you are not. It is so important that you understand that. And I'm speaking to you from a person that has been on the edge, that has been on the brink of feeling like there has not been something there. So please remember, be kind to one another. You are loved and you are important. And please, please remember 
you are not alone. Take care, everybody. Bye.